Well, good morning and welcome to this week's online service for St. Kenneth's. I welcome you all, whether you've been here every week or whether you have, in fact, just come across our pages in more recent days. I trust you're all safe and well and enjoying some more of the, the relaxations on our lockdown conditions of the past months. I'll remind you that there is a, a fuller um, statement about <clears throat> what we as a congregation are be beginning to plan for with regards to um, the next few uh, months or so in the congregation to be found at our church website which is stkenneths.org.uk Please go there and, and read that statement if it's of interest to you. Today we continue our series in the Apostles' Creed and we reach what could be seen as a, a dark line of the creed where Jesus descended to the dead. But as we'll see, there is hope in the midst of that too. But for now we've come together as the family of God in our Father's presence to offer him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and to receive his holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, to ask his forgiveness of our sin and to seek his grace that through his Son, Jesus Christ, we may give ourselves to his service. The Lord is here, and his Spirit is with us. Let us worship God. Let us pray. It was an empty day, Lord Jesus, that day after you died. Hope was gone. Light was extinguished darkness ruled, and yet your resurrection word hung in the air. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. It was too much for the religious folk of the day to handle your word of life. Perhaps, Lord, it is too much for us too. For in our despair, hope is gone, light is extinguished, darkness rules. Or so we think, for through your power, hope is restored, light floods our hearts, darkness is banished. As we worship you, help us to reach out in faith, believing that new life is there for us. Yet even as we worship, he must also plead your forgiveness. For we ask you to break the seals of bitterness. For we ask you to break the seals of resentment. For we ask you to break the seals of anger. Grant, Lord, that receiving your forgiveness, we might resolve again to serve you in that resurrection power you promise and for your name's sake even as we sum up our prayers in the words you gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now Norman Cooper is going to bring to us our scripture for this morning. I read from Matthew's chapter 27, from verse 62, the guard at the tomb. The next day, which was a Sabbath, the chief priests and the Pharisees met with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that while that liar was still alive, he said, I will be raised to life three days later. Give orders then for his tomb to be carefully guarded until the third day, so that his disciples will not be able to go and steal the body and then tell the people that he was raised from death. This last lie would be even worse than the first one. Take a guard, Pilate told them, 
Go and make the tomb as secure as you can. So they left and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and leaving the guard on watch. Amen. I wonder how you are feeling today. For sure, how you've been feeling throughout this time of lockdown has probably gone up and down. You've probably had days that were okay and days that were less okay. But today, as we continue through our creed, the Apostles' Creed, and come to this line, Jesus descended to the dead, we enter into a part of the story that feels a bit dangerous, where we really feel a bit vulnerable. Because we enter a day when all was not okay for those around. On one level, the religious leaders of the day thought they'd done it. They thought that Jesus was banished forever, that this threat upon their way of life and their control over the people, for that is what the Pharisees often exerted, was removed forever. Of course, those of us <clears throat> who are today Christians believe very much that this point we're at today is not the end of the story. That there is resurrection to come. More of that <clears throat> in a few moments and indeed in much greater detail next Sunday. But for the moment we are in this uncertain place. Yes, the religious leaders thought they had done it, thought they had accomplished their goal in being rid of the Lord. And yet, I suggest that a sense of uncertainty still hung in the air, particularly for those who had followed Jesus in his earthly life. For so much of their hopes and plans and dreams appeared as shattered. What were they to do now that their Lord was taken from them? How would they begin again? Was there to be a new normal for them? They might well have found themselves in the depths of despair. Perhaps you might wonder why this line in the Crete is even included when there is so little in the way of scriptural detail about this part of the story. Well, I think it's there because it reveals to us that in Jesus we have a Saviour who did not shrink from descending to the lowest depths for our sakes. He descended to the depths, he descended even to the dead, so that we would know that we had a saviour who could truly understand what life was about for us when we felt that we were in that place of death and of being in the depths. And so, as we begin to look at our passage today, I want to notice the remarks of the chief priests and the Pharisees, first of all. Addressing Pilate, they said, We remember that while he, that's Jesus, was alive, the deceiver said, After three days I will rise again. And so notice that the religious leaders call Jesus the deceiver. And that, for me, says that in those moments when we find ourselves, perhaps, in the depths. Our attitudes to Jesus might change. Perhaps we might side with the Pharisees who call him a deceiver. It might feel to us as though Jesus has deceived us. He has promised us light and life and hope. And all we seem to experience 
is darkness and death and despair. The New Revised Standard Version of the Bible puts it perhaps even more strongly, for it labels Jesus in this verse an imposter. Do we look at Jesus in these moments of despair and think there is no way that Jesus can be who he claims to be, the very Son of God and the one who is for us? Perhaps we think back to those wonderful I am sayings of Jesus that we find particularly in John's Gospel. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth and the life and so on. And begin to doubt whether Jesus really can measure up to these claims that he makes about himself. And yet, I believe that we are called to trust in those moments when we are in the depths. We are called to trust that there is a way, that there is truth, and there is life to be found, and not just a way, but the way, and it is indeed Jesus himself. The point is that I want to urge you not to be taken in by thoughts that Jesus might not be who he said he was, that he might not love you, that he might not care for you, that he might not desire the very best for you. He does. And he wants you to come out of that place of despair, if that's indeed where you find yourself this morning. And I do trust that this word would ring true for somebody today. If it's you, then please believe that Jesus is there for you and wants to lift you from that place of despair and to restore your faith in him to banish that thought of him as a deceiver and to restore that thought, that reality of him as your saviour and friend. Secondly, we see that the Pharisees wanted to avoid all talk of resurrection. We see that Pilate gives the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. What do we keep back as though to banish God's resurrection power in our life? What do we keep secure at the expense of God's resurrection power, of Jesus' resurrection power? Perhaps it is an attitude. Perhaps it is a way of life. Perhaps it is simply a lack of trust. There is this threat hanging in the air that the disciples might come and steal the body. The disciples might come and steal that which on the third day will indeed be proof of resurrection. And I want to say to you today that whenever it feels as though that which is proof of resurrection for you in your life is about to be snatched away. Please trust that God wants to protect you from that and to restore to you all that speaks of resurrection.
in your life. Perhaps, too, the Pharisees were just keen to be those on the top as far as religion was concerned. For until Jesus came, what they said went. They were not used to being challenged. They were not used to having someone else stake a claim for a particular we have life, a way of following God that seemed to run contrary in some ways to that which they had espoused for so many years. You can perhaps understand their insecurity, and yet, how much better it is to surrender what we might feel to be securities about how we express our life as a church, how we express even our faith as a church, if it means that the ways in which Jesus wants us to live and to express our faith are brought to the fore. Perhaps talk of resurrection, friends, means that there are things that must be put to death that will in fact not rise again. Perhaps life with Jesus, life in Jesus' resurrection power was never meant to be the same again. Thirdly and finally we see that the Pharisees put a seal on the stone. Pilate urged them to take a guard and go and make the tomb as secure as they knew how. And so they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Now, in those days, to secure a tomb, that was precisely what was done. A seal would be placed over the, the tomb and the government emblem would be placed upon that seal to underline just how final that act was. And what's more, the penalty for breaking such seals was death. How ironic, how glorious, gloriously ironic, that when the seal of the tomb of Jesus was broken, it was not going to be about death, but about life and life in all fullness. So, what seal needs to be broken in your life that you might discover life and life to the full? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let's continue with our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, how we thank you that you came to put death behind you and death behind us forever. That you came to give the hope of new life to all who would receive it. That you came to give the hope that is beyond all hopes 
to us. And yet we come to pray, Lord, today for all who have no hope, who have struggled to accept that gospel that is the greatest hope, who have struggled to accept the circumstances they face in their lives, who have struggled to accept Things that have happened perhaps to family members and friends. We pray for all who have continued to battle through the effects of COVID-19. Some, many indeed in this country, but many also elsewhere. And many particularly in places where war and conflict rage on as well. Like Yemen and parts of Africa. We ask, O oh God, that you would bring hope and indeed new life to all who suffer today and to all who watch and wait with them and care for them in our health services and in health services around the world. We come to you for our governments in Edinburgh and Westminster. We pray that you would grant to them such a measure of your presence, that they too see a way to new life and new hope, and that they would bring about policies that offer that new life and that new hope to those most in need, to those on the breadline, to those who have lost their jobs, to those who feel emotionally and spiritually diminished as a result of the events of recent months. And Father, we come to you with our own prayers. For all who are ill at home, in hospital or in care home. For all who have been bereaved. And for all who are anxious or afraid. Hear us as we name them before you, in the silence of our hearts. Father, take our prayers and answer them, not merely according to our asking, but according to your love and purpose for us, and for all those for whom we have prayed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and lives and reigns with you, Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, blessed for ever. Amen. Once again, can I thank you for joining with me today and remind you that there will be midweek musings on Wednesday before a service again next Sunday. And now may grace, mercy and peace from God our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, Rest and abide with each and every one of you, and all whom you love, those with you now, those further afield, and those now at rest and gathered with their Maker now, and even forevermore.